a, a group, a rock group called Extreme, and uh, sort of one of those that came and went, and I've always loved that song. The lyrics are so profound. There's a hole in my heart that can only be filled by you. Now, they're not saying who the you is, but we know who that is. And, and it's true. I mean, this goes back to the 4th century. St. Augustine said, we all have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And what happens is we try to fill that hole with other things. Ultimately, we realize sooner or later, better that it's sooner, that those things don't fit. They don't fulfill us. They don't make us wholehearted. W-H-O-L-E. Because that's God's desire. God's desire is that you are wholehearted. W-H-O-L-E. And, and that's really what we're talking about today. As we get into this... Uh, now it's the fifth week of our series, Relationships or Sinks. We're talking about relationship issues. Uh, just to kind of map where we've been, we started out talking about marriage and romantic relationships. We talked about family relationships. We talked about friend relationships. Last week we talked about neighbor relationships. Today we're talking about broken relationships. Broken relationships. And that touches every one of us on so many different levels. All those relationships we've discussed so far can have brokenness. And they affect our heart. They break our hearts, don't they? Uh, so, just to be transparent with you, just as an example, um, maybe you have stories like mine. A lot of people think just because I'm a pastor, I'm like way above all the problems of life and the difficulties. Um, broken family relationships are things that affect all of us. My family, for instance, when my grandmother passed away, it was the classic example of her will. And what happened with her will, creating a very serious divide between my mom and, and her brother and sister, and the cousins and nephews, and it just kind of went on from there, that exists to this day. And real heartache, real brokenness in our family because of that. When it, you know, we talk about, you know, one of the things you should do, we should all do, is be very clear in our will. Uh, because, not just because of where assets end up, but because of what it can do to families who are left behind. Never leave them guessing. So we tell people whenever you're you want something to come to the church, for instance, or any organization, be utterly clear. Don't assume that they know that. Because all those assumptions can often lead to real brokenness in families. There are all kinds of things. We all have stories about brokenness in our families, don't we? There are broken friendships. Uh, I certainly have been touched by broken friendships. And the longer you've been a friend with someone, the harder that is, the deeper that break is. In fact, here's one statistic. More than two-thirds of Americans said they have lost at least 90% of the friends they have had for 10 years. Isn't that crazy? It's heartening. That's, that's disheartening, isn't it? It's, that's a hard statistic to get our minds around. Well, how about broken couples? Helen Chin tells us that 85% of relationships end up in breakups. 85% of relationships. We already know the statistic about marriage. 50% of marriages end in divorce. But this relationship dynamic before and leading up to marriage is interesting. That famous dating website eHarmony reports that most people will date 12 people before getting married. What that means is you're going to have 11 either real duds or heartbreaks. And, and someone has aptly said, reflecting on that reality for most people, the concept of 11 breakups per person makes me sincerely fear for our nation's Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia supply. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not, right? I mean, gosh, we just, we go through so much heartache at so many levels in relationships. Marriages, And we talked about the marriage statistic. I was really actually surprised to hear, according to Dr. Melanie Greenberg, psychologist, the top three reasons why relationships fail, why marriage relationships fail. Now, you just think in your head what they might be. Kind of get it there in your head. And let me tell you what she says the top three reasons are. This might surprise you. It might not. The first one is selfishness, narcissism, and unbalanced ties. We know what selfishness and narcissism is, very focused on yourself. Unbalanced ties has to do with one, one party, the husband or, or wife, 
having all the focus on all of their interests. And it's very unbalanced. That's unbalanced ties. The second uh, reason relationships fail is not making a relationship a priority. That's just kind of, kind of speaks for itself. Number three is angry outbursts and rage. Now, what were your top three? Uh, you know, I mean, it, they may not have been these. But those are the top three reasons why I re- brokenness in, rela- in relationships, in marriages. How about children? Children often go voiceless and we don't consider their brokenness and the impacts. But it often sets a trajectory for what they carry into and impacts all other relationships. And so it's so important. So, so important. And since 1960, the proportion of children who do not live with their own two parents has risen from 19.4% to more than double. And that's just from the 1990s. Imagine how much higher it is now. I couldn't find that statistic. We know this about teenagers when they're living uh, in a single family household. Three out of four teenager suicides occur in households where one parent has been absent. That should really alarm us. And it's especially the case that fatherless children are dramatically greater risk of suicide. Do you see what I'm getting at here? I mean, we all have stories and we can, we can sh- spend all day sharing those at so many different levels of brokenness in various relationships. They touch us deeply. So what do you do? What do you do when something so important, when something so meaningful is broken? When it breaks and you've been depending on it? Well, let me get at that a little bit by telling you a little bit of a story. And this has to do with an Australian Aboriginal tribe called the Achilpa tribe. They're a nomadic tribe. They travel around the outback of Australia. And the, the legend, the myth of the Achilpa people goes like this. The god Numbakola, he, uh, he took a gum tree and he dipped it in blood and erected it so that it connected the earth to the sky. He climbed up the gum tree and disappeared into the heavens. So, the Achilpa tribe carries around with it, because it's nomadic, they travel everywhere, this kind of a gum tree, sort of a portable gum tree. And it is sort of like the centerpiece of their life, of their faith, connecting them to the heavens, connecting them to their God, literally directing their paths. Wherever the gum tree is swayed according to the wind, or wherever branches point, that's the direction that they go. It's an interesting kind of concept, right? Until one day, something tragic happened with the gum tree. It broke. And the center of their identity, that which held their little world together, no longer did so. They didn't know what to do. They were wandering around aimlessly. And in the end, what they did was they laid down on their backs waiting for the sky to fall down. And I want to suggest that broken relationships often feel a lot like that. You know, it was the center. It was everything. It was the direction. It was all of your meaning and identity. And now... Just waiting for the sky to fall down. That's the effect. This week my wife was out of town and when she's out of town I get to control the remote control. And, uh, and so I, I watched a documentary. Uh, she probably would have liked it. Um, it's called I Am, uh, which is a quite interesting title. But it's a, it's a very intriguing documentary of a, a very uh, famous Hollywood director. You might not know his name, but he did some famous movies. And he had an accident. And the accident and near-death experience caused him to reorient his life and think about some of these kinds of deep questions. Two questions in particular that came up are, what's wrong with our world and what can we do about it? So here's a little bit of a trailer from the documentary, I Am. My name is Tom Shadiak. I'm a movie director. Action! Facing my own death brought an instant sense of clarity and purpose. Euphoria! 
I decided to grab a camera and a film crew of four and start a journey to spark a conversation around challenging and rarely asked questions. Have you ever seen any of my movies? Did you ever see Ace Ventura? Ace Ventura? Did you ever hear that movie? It's a Jim Carrey movie? No. See, I need a dose of reality. We are asking some of today's significant minds what's wrong with our world and what can we do about it? Most importantly, what we could do about it. Yeah. Those are the two questions. And it's an intriguing documentary as he travels around and asks a lot of deep thinkers in different fields what's wrong with the world and what can we do about it? You know, the answer to the first question is really easy from a biblical Christian perspective. It's very simple. We broke relationship with God. That's the story of the Garden of Eden. And out of that broken relationship with God, everything else gets broken. All of our other relationships. We should never be surprised by brokenness in our lives. Because it's an outgrowth of the original brokenness. We call it sin. But think of it that way. The original brokenness between us and God. And Jesus comes to repair that. But we should never be surprised. Brendan Manning, you've heard me talk about Brendan Manning a lot. Here's a wonderful quote from his book, The Ragamuffin Gospel. He said this, To be alive is to be broken. And to be broken is to stand in need of grace. That's right where we want to be. That's a realistic view of life and of our need. What's wrong with this world? It's broken. It, it starts with a broken relationship with God. And that flows into every other relationship. But then there's the second question. It's one thing to have the answer to what's wrong, but what are you going to do about it? How can we do anything about it? Well, it was uh, Albert Einstein who suggested that if you have a problem, in order to address that problem, you have to have a different way of thinking than the thinking that got you to that problem. Do you follow that? Here's another way that he put it. He said, we shall require substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. That kind of raises the stakes. In other words, wherever we're broken, and however we've been dealing with it, if, we have, if we're at an impasse, we have to reset and let God turn around and change our thinking. That's what repentance means, by the way. It's a 180 degree turn of the way we think. But where do you start? You don't start with the big picture, like the original question, what's wrong with our world? It's not the world out there that you focus on. It's the world in here, specifically your heart. The heart is what's most important to God all throughout Scripture. Again and again, it's repeated that your heart is where all transformation starts. That's where things began to fall apart in the heart. And it affects everything. And so let me give you an example of that in Proverbs chapter 3. This comes to us as what's called wisdom literature. And this is literature from in the scriptures that is basically saying, this is how you live. You want to you wanna get reoriented back to God and in all of your relationships, do this. And so this is what the writer of Proverbs says. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. Not in your head, not in your deeds, but in your heart. Because out of your heart, everything flows. So that's the first mention of heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. There it is again. Such emphasis on the heart. Then you will win favor and good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not your head. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know the Bible completely. Trust with your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. See, there's the hurdle for us, right? Because we want to have it all together. We want to have everything lined up, be able to explain it. No. Who can explain anything perfectly in life? Trust is about leaning into something without knowing fully how to explain it. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Not some of your ways, not most of your ways. In all of your ways. This is a heart, heart thing. And He will make straight your paths. In other words, don't try to make your life straight. Don't try to straighten it all out yourself. Because you can't. You're handicapped spiritually. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to 
your bones. Incredible words of wisdom. The heart is mentioned three times in there. That's the centerpiece of what we're called to do and focus on. Start with your heart. Trust God with a broken heart. Trust God with whatever is broken in the relationships in your life. You know why? Because that's God's specialty. God specializes in using broken relationships to heal you and others. This is what God has always done. And he sent Jesus as God incarnate to show us what that looks like. Remember when Jesus was meeting this woman in Samaria at the well? Called the woman at the well. And he's, she's there in the middle of the day because she is a woman who has a reputation. And that was the hottest time of the day and no one else would be there. So she's sort of hiding from everyone. But Jesus meets her there. You can never hide from Jesus. And he says to her, after she's trying to draw water out of the well, he says, uh, I, I, I know what you're about. You've had five husbands. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Now, in today's society, that wouldn't be much of a big deal, right? Back then, it was hugely taboo. And Jesus said, you've, you've come here to draw this water, but what I have to give you is living water. You'll be thirsty with this water. You know, it'll, it'll satisfy you momentarily, but what I have to give you will keep on welling up in you like a spring of living water. And this gets her attention. And, and she realizes this guy is the Messiah. He knows everything about me. She goes back and she tells the people in her village what he has done. Now, I want you to note that she didn't get her life together first. I want you to recognize that she was still a woman in, who had a reputation. She was still a woman who was existing in severe brokenness and sin. But Jesus used her anyway. How do I know that? Well, look at verse 39 in the fourth chapter of John. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Why? Because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. She didn't do 12 Hail Marys and learn her Bible and be able to answer everything about her faith and live a perfect life before Jesus would use her. He used her brokenness. He used her, her short-sightedness. He used all of her handicaps. To bring others to him. That's what God does with you and me. With our brokenness. With our broken hearts. With our broken relationships. They're not just something to be embarrassed about and shunned and ignored. In fact, they can be used in powerful ways. You ever heard the story of the cracked pot? The parable of the cracked pot? You've probably heard it before. It's, it's set back in India in the ancient times. And there's an Indian water bearer who has two pots on a stick that he carries over his shoulders. And he's going to the well, just like the woman at the well, to retrieve water for his, his master every day. It's a long path. One of the pots has a crack in it. So on his way back, it's constantly leaking. And it's about half full by the time he gets back. And he's walking back and forth. And one day the pot begins to speak to him and says, I am so sorry. I'm a cracked pot. I leave... That's where the term comes from. I, I, I don't... I'm not able to give you all the water that you need to make the master happy. I'm so sorry for my flaw. To which he says, I want you to look as we walk back today at the beautiful flowers that have grown because of your flaw. You see, I've always known about your flaw. And I've leveraged it and used it to create something beautiful. That's the gospel, guys. That's what God does. That's what Jesus showed us. You see, we always want to kind of ignore our pain. But God never wastes a pain. You ever heard that quote before? God never wastes a pain. We waste our pain. We often think that this is just something, oh, uh, mm, and we repress it. But God wants to use it. Our very brokenness. And make something beautiful out of it. The Japanese have a very interesting thing that they do. Whenever they make a lot of beautiful pottery. And whenever a piece of pottery breaks. They will put it back together. And fill in the cracks with real gold. They aggrandize the damage. Filling the cracks with real gold. Why? They believe that when something has suffered damage. And has a history. It becomes even more beautiful. That's what God does with you and me. 
We don't have to be afraid to give him the deepest, darkest, most broken parts of who we are. Because that's what he'll do. He'll fill us with his beauty. Something we can't do for ourselves. Healing your heart does not mean erasing reality. Healing your heart means redeeming reality. This is God's work, not ours. It's about giving him our hearts. I had uh, experience of some people kind of wanting to erase reality. Uh, a few different communications this week. Snail mail, email, and texting. Uh, one person emailed me and said, uh, I, I have this pain, this, this hurt, this wound in a relationship. And, and she asked, you know, if I forgive, do I also forget? And obviously she wasn't going into any detail, but it was a reference to a real wound, a real brokenness in a relationship. Another person talked about a brokenness in a relationship in the church, and, and she went away from the church for a while because of that kind of brokenness. It happens even in the church, because we're sinful, fallible people too. And yet another person texted me, and she said, my, my mom has no idea how much she's hurting me. And I don't know what to do about it. And I said, protect your heart. And she said, too late. To which I said, so you need to begin to heal your heart. That's where it all starts, is the healing of the heart. The healing of the heart. The dominant focus on healing in Scripture is on healing as restoration and rebuilding. Restoration and rebuilding. Let me give you some examples of this. Think back about the ancient times in the Old Testament with the Hebrews who were slaves in Egypt. For 400 years, working seven days a week, they were property. They had no rights. They were basically work, treated worse than animals. And what does God do? He rescues their dignity. He gives them a new identity. He restores their soul, their worth, their personhood, because it had been robbed of them. That's what redemption is. Restoring and rebuilding from the inside out. Later on, they get into the promised land. They have a sense of identity, a sense of being God's people. But then they're taken into exile into Babylon. And their city is ransacked. The temple is torn down. Once they come back to Jerusalem, guess what they're faced with? Oh my gosh, we've got to rebuild this. We've got to restore this. And through God's power and direction, they do. This is the theme throughout Scripture. And Jesus practiced this at, a, at an emotional, physical, and spiritual level with people. A man comes to him who's blind, and Jesus touches his eyes and restores his vision. A man is, lo is lowered down before him, and he's lame, he's crippled, he can't walk. And Jesus says, stand up and walk. He restores his ability to walk. Several dead people are given new life. They're restored to life. Jesus began his ministry. He set this precedent by identifying exactly what he was here to do. Remember John the Baptist? He's the one that baptized Jesus. Before he baptized Jesus, John the Baptist sent his disciples to this guy Jesus, who John didn't, didn't really understand who he was. And, and they come to ask him, Who are you and what are you up to? And we see the answer in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. So Jesus replied to the messengers of John, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. This is this pattern again and again of how Jesus heals, of how God heals us. Because of Jesus, your brokenness does not define you. He defines you. His grace, He redeemed you, He restores you, He rebuilds you. It's what you can't do for yourself that He does for you. Jesus can take a broken heart and He alone can make it a whole heart. W-H-O-L-E. What does that look like though? What does it look like to be wholehearted? What does it look like to have that kind of healed heart? We should all be curious about that because if you haven't experienced some brokenness in your life, guess what? If only by a death, you will. You will. Well, in, in the Hebrew tradition in the Old Testament, we get this word shalem. Now, I know you think I'm mispronouncing shalom. I'm not. Shalem actually is a derivative of shalom. 
which we know as the word peace. Shalem means healing that makes you whole, complete, or sound. And it comes from shalom, which is peace. Now, we often misunderstand the way shalom is, uh, is understood. Peace is not just the cessation or the absence of violence. It is that which makes for your greatest good. Is there anybody here that does not want that which makes for your greatest good in this life? That's shalom. And we get that through the healing of shalom, the healing of God. That's what makes us whole. The love of God. God's unconditional love is the shalom that makes a broken heart whole. All other love doesn't reach far enough in. There's a very interesting uh, quote I want to share with you from a physician. He was actually a cancer surgeon and oncologist. A guy named Dr. Bernie Siegel. And he wrote a book called Love, Medicine, and Miracles. All about cancer and how to treat cancer from an alternative perspective. And I'm absolutely fascinated about something that I want to share with you that he wrote in this book, Love, Medicine, and Miracles. Now think about this. This is for cancer patients who have a terminal diagnosis. And he said this, I am convinced that unconditional love is the most powerful known stimulant of the immune system. If I told patients to raise their blood levels of immune globulins or killer T cells, no one would know how to do it. But if I can teach them to love themselves and others fully, the same changes happen automatically. The truth is, love heals. Isn't that incredible? I love when we find something in science that simply supports what the Bible's already taught us. And what is the ultimate love that heals? The only love that is ultimate is unconditional love. You and I don't have totally perfect unconditional love, but God does. And so as we draw closer to him, into his word, claiming the promises, experiencing his spirit, experiencing Jesus working in us, it's healing. And he's not going to erase the heartache. He's not going to, you know, you, you can't pretend those things don't exist. He will fill in those cracks though with his beauty. He'll make something of it that you can't even imagine. God's love is the only unconditional love you'll experience. How do you experience his healing love? Right back to the wisdom literature. Verses 5 and 6, I think, are, are sort of a nutshell for us to focus on. And the first word says it all, trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Because we do, we lean so much on ourselves, our own willpower, our own ability. Oh, I can handle it. A lot of times when things go wrong in people's lives, you know what they do? They do the exact opposite thing they should do. They hide. They disappear from the church. When there's brokenness, they go away instead of entering into the community of grace and seeking God's power and the support of those who are walking with them through it. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. That's the promise. To trust God is to lean on what God alone can do with your broken heart and your broken relationships. Not on what you can do with them. That's so important. And it's, listen, honestly, it's vulnerable. It's really vulnerable and it's really hard. When you just sort of admit that I can't control all this, I can't heal this, I can't do it, and you put it all in God, it's really leaning into what God promises to do. That's trust. You ever done the trust fall? Anybody here ever done the trust fall before? The exercise? Awesome. Yeah, it's a really scary exercise. I've done this at several camps where you stand up on a platform, people are behind you, and here's what you have to do. You put your hands over your, your, uh, your chest like so because they don't want you going back like this because you'll whack people in the face when you fall. So you do that and you have to stiffen your body completely as you fall. Which is so, you want to cave in and make it a little less scary. But you stiffen your body and it's a full weighted fall into their arms. And it is exactly as it's described, a trust fall. And that's exactly what the writer of Proverbs is telling us you and I have to do. To receive God's healing. Trust. Trust Him. Fall into His trust. Full weighted. All of your heart. All of your brokenness. And let Him begin to make it whole. Let Him fill those cracks. 
You see, we often think that faith is all about this cognitive thing, this cerebral thing. I've got to know it all, I've got to be able to explain it all. And No, it's not. Think of someone like Mother Teresa. A paradigm of faith, right? A paragon of faith. And she admitted that she never had clarity. Complete clarity. Who would have guessed that? That Mother Teresa never had complete clarity about her faith. But this is what she said. The one thing that I always had is trust. Trust. She's telling us exactly what the writer of Proverbs is telling us. Trust. That's the key. Trust God to fill in the cracks with his beauty. Trust God to bring new life through your brokenness. Not around it. Not after you've gotten your life together. Trust God to redeem and restore and rebuild your heart. Trust God to define your reality. Trust God to give you the kind of shalom, shalem, the kind of healing that only he can give through his unconditional love. Trust God. Because his unconditional love is the only love that can make you and me wholehearted. Amen? And amen. Let's pray together.